Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Brian for Breaking Down Security. And this week is another special podcast. Um, I know some of you have uh, enjoyed the audio that we've gotten from various conventions that we've been to, whether it be DerbyCon or um, uh, the other ones. Uh, I forget which ones they are, but um, uh, this one uh, is from a conference called SourceCon. And uh, we, we interviewed uh, two different groups of people. Actually, we had the first uh, interview. We'll have two people in it, Lee and Paul from PreOS Security. And the second one is um, Joe Basirico from Security Innovations talking about bug bounty programs and, and how to get the most out of your bug bounty program. He also uh, spoke at uh, Source. Very interesting conference, uh, Source Seattle. Uh, I've been to the one last year and one this year, uh, very much like a B-Sides. And the amount of discussion you get and the kinds of talks that you get are, are very, uh, very, very nice. So we had everything from threat modeling with Robert Hurlbut, who we've had on the show, uh, to really highly technical discussions about uh, chip diagnostics with... Um, uh, some of the folks in the afternoon, and we've had people like Adam Showstack on and Gunther Olam from uh, from Microsoft. Uh, Adam now works on it on his own, and you know, so yeah. And there's workshops about not even about security stuff. It's like, um, well, the threat modeling one was Robert Hurl, but the other one was the uh, public speaking. So if you're not very good at speaking. You know, it bothers you. Uh, Rob Chain, who actually organizes SourceCon, does the uh, workshop on how to be a better speaker. So, I mean, that's, uh, you know, all of the, the talks and the workshops that you get um, at Source are real, actionable, uh, you know, topics that you can take back and start working on immediately in your organization, which I I think is uh, is most excellent. So, um, yeah, like uh, like I said, the, the first talks uh, that you'll hear is Lee and Paul talking about uh, firmware security and, and uh, UEFI security in your computers. And the second one is uh, Joe talking about uh, how to get the most out of your bug bounty program, how to have a uh, collaborative environment. So um, before I go, we have an intro to reverse engineering course. It's being taught by a good friend of ours, Tyler Hudak. Uh, he analyzes malware, but he's asked us very nicely to uh, set up some uh, reverse engineering courses. So um, you can go to our Patreon, and there's instructions on how to do uh, how to do the uh, the sign up there. Um, I'll also put a link in the show notes to the syllabus. Uh, for instance, um, so to give you an idea of what you're going to learn in the class, if you sign up, uh, session one is about introduction to x86 assembly. Uh, introduction to x64 debugging so you'll learn things like breakpoints uh, imports and apis and patching code and there'll also be an introduction to ida pro so um, you'll you'll get to understand shell code and there's a bunch of other stuff in the other three sessions that you're going to learn uh, some of the prerequisites are there's a book that he's asked you to look at if you uh, want to understand more of the basics of assembler at beginners.re uh, I also suggested the PC assembly book at pacman128.github.io. And uh, some of the things you'll need to set up for the class you can get at modern.ie and uh, the freer demo version of IDA Pro and X64 Debug. All that information is in the course syllabus, and you can find that, uh, find that in the show notes. So um, that was it. I just wanted to uh, put out a quick uh, hey for the class. Uh, it starts on the October 30th, by the way, so you still have some time to sign up, and it goes for four Mondays, so you'll still have plenty of time to sign up if, you've, uh, if you're have if you hearing this just now and, and didn't know what was going on. So, um, yeah, that was it. Uh, join us on our Slack. We have an active Slack. Uh, you can hear, uh, you know, hear us talking about all kinds of subjects on there. Well, not hear us, but you can, you know, there's a lot of topics going on on the Slack. We've got a lot of uh, uh, different channels like security architecture and vendor management channel. We have a SIM channel, which is quite active. We have a malware and reverse engineering one. We have um, a vulnerability and breaches channel, which is actually very active because um, the week of, what, the 17th was the crack Wi-Fi access uh, point vulnerability, so everybody was talking about that. 
And we have a lot of stuff going on. So join us at uh, breaksec.signup.team and you can uh, join us. We have uh, 700 and almost 800 people in the, in, the, in the hallway con. So please join us. So that was it. I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Paul and Lee and myself at SourceCon. Have a great week. We will be back uh, next week with a with an interview, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so that was it. Uh, have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. So hello, this is Brian from uh, Source Seattle 2017. Um, doing some audio from this conference, which was uh, actually the first day has gone really great. Was, um, had a workshop with Robert Hurlbut, who we've had on the show before. Uh, about threat modeling, which was uh, very eye-opening. Some things I've learned that uh, I didn't expect. Uh, ne- but, so I couldn't get Robert because he's got some NDA issues with his new company. We'll try to fix that later uh, down the road. But uh, today, I have some people who are going to be speaking tomorrow and also at something called Seagull, which is in Seattle. Um, so we have Paul and Lee. Uh, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So... You guys run a company that you've just started. You're all startup-y and whatever um, called pre-OS or what you call it, pre-OS? So I, I, I like pre-OS better myself. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, we've had all sorts of people responding to that. Um, so we're focusing on firmware-level security. And when we talk about firmware, we're talking about um, mostly assembly code or, or binary blobs. Um, we're not talking about uh, Internet of Things in our case. We're talking about what's called platform firmware. So um, the embedded Linux that you get on your on your router is not in the scope of what we're talking about. Um, but firmware level security is a critical area. It's new. The uh, the saying goes, uh, firmware is the new software. Okay. So um, there have been like news recently about uh, Intel's management processor that was activated and was running over specific ports on the NIC, and you know people found out that there was a way to disable this. Is is this what you're what kind of stuff you're talking about? Firming, you know, securing that and making sure that people don't don't get uh, taken by that anymore. Uh, actually, you kind of caught me there. Uh, so Intel's management processor is actually a great example. Um, that's that's actually baked into the Intel chip itself. Um, but a lot of that kind of technology uh, or pre- previous versions of that technology like IPMI um, and uh, Redfish, other ones were on a secondary onboard processor and effectively that was another in- embedded Linux. Um, so that would be a whole firmware install. Um, in this case, since we're talking about something that's actually on the processor, now the only way to fix it is with a microcode update um, or, or, or some other lower level uh, type of, type of uh, fix. Um, that one, but that one was a very good example of a recent huge problem. So Intel shipped these chips; they're out in the field, and now they have this problem that can only be addressed at the firmware level. Okay. And, and microcode for those of you, us who don't understand is um, what we use to update processors and BIOS. Yeah. Uh, microcode basically is the firmware that updates the instruction sets. So if Intel has a problem with its instructions, uh, microcode can patch that. Okay, so back in the day before UEFI, everyone would boot to DOS, regardless of the OS they had, flash whatever Phoenix BIOS or whatever it was, you know, with a floppy drive or whatever, and, and, and go on. How has that changed with UEFI and with, you know, the new forms of, of you know, firmware? Um, so I, I think one way of thinking about it is that UEFI itself is almost an entire DOS by itself. Um, it has loadable modules. You can you can run Python code in it, um, JavaScript now. So it's a it's a fairly complex system in and of itself. Um, UFI though is just one of the many firmwares on your motherboard. You've got PCI blobs. You've got uh, uh, ACPI. You've got the management management and AMT that you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, USB. Basically anything and everything you can plug into your computer. And you know most of the major subsystems on your computer have their own firmware. Every hard drive has its own firmware on on the actual hard drive, and then there's firmware corresponding on the controller side that talks to that hard drive. Um, so, and and all of these can and have been hacked. Basically, okay. um, at, there's at least a few examples in the wild for just about every firmware you can imagine. Even monitors nowadays have firmware embedded in them. Um, so that 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 has been hacked at uh, last year's Black Hat, uh, right 2016. On. Okay, so um, I'm going to get Lee in here fine, eventually. So. 
Uh, Lee, uh, you're both local to Seattle, right? Yes. Okay. So, Lee, you were talking to me last night at CSEC East about the coprocessor actually runs Minix. Well, so the Intel uh, management engine is what we were talking about earlier. Um, it's recently been reported by security researchers that it contains strings that are also inside the Minix kernel. So, therefore, they're assuming that it's based on the Minix operating system. So, um, that's kind of humorous. Uh, recently, the security, security researchers have discovered how to disable the management, management engine. Uh, um, so, I think Core Boot has that ability now, and that's going to make life a little bit more interesting for security. There's a the people that discovered how to disable it. Now they're giving a talk at, at Black Hat on how to run run your own code there. So it's it's going to become more interesting because you might find more malware there now, not just Intel's um, tools that you didn't know what they're doing. Now you might find malicious code. You mentioned Core Boot. Is that a flavor of firmware operating system? So. Core Boot is is an example of a of a of a system um, firmware technology and bootloader. Um, in the old days, it was BIOS. UEFI is now kind of the new one for Windows machines. Uh, Chrome Chromebooks use Core Boot. Um, Core Boot is used in a variety of embedded Linux systems. Another re technology technology related to Core Boot is U Boot, DOS U Boot, another bootloader. Okay. So uh, Core Boot is used on Chromeboxes and um, and a variety of Linux machines. Um, so, um, and and it's, it gets rather interesting because Core Boot and U Boot both load payloads, and they both now have the ability to load UEFI as a payload. So, Core Boot can load UEFI. Um, it's kind of interesting. So, it'd be like bootstrapping a Windows kernel through Grub. It's 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 it, 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 yeah, and um, also. UEFI has kind of a two-part initialization phase. The first part's called the platform initialization, PI, and then the latter part's the traditional UEFI component. And there's a there are, there's a technical mixture of core boot that uses core boot as the payload uh, for the initialization code for UEFI. So there's a, yet another way to do it. Um, so yeah, you can mix up core boot and uBoot and, and UEFI. But um, in general, UEFI you'll see on Windows boxes and on servers, and you'll see Chrome on Android machines and on, on, on Chrome boxes. Okay. So tomorrow, your talk is about what? Uh, so the talk we're giving is on um, how how blue teams should be um, looking at firmware and enterprises, how to defend your your system. So mostly, it's it's uh, looking at Intel UEFI systems, how you would examine the firmware for malware. So um, techniques to dump the ROM into a file so you could do offline processing on that file, you know, r dumping that file every night, diffing the file, looking for changes, and those changes may be an evil mate attack. It may be a firmware update with vendor changes, right? So you have to understand what's there. The biggest problem, I think, right now with, with firmware is that most security people don't look at firmware. They only look at operating system binaries and app binaries. And uh, so when they talk golden images and all that, that's great for apps and operating systems, but they're still using an unknown blob for their firmware. They're not checking it for, for malware. They don't know when things change. They don't know what's in it. it it's it's rather scary. So do people, I mean, I don't know of any blue teams, at least when I was doing blue teaming, I, you know, I never updated my firmware. So what, what's the threat model for somebody who needs to update their firmware and worry about malware? Are we talking like nation state kind of stuff? Uh, well, firmware level attacks are more difficult than uh, software level attacks because software is easier to install. And firmware is harder to install, so it's harder to um, create firmware level malware uh, for that reason mostly. Uh, if the malware is done right, it's fairly machine independent because UEFI is, works on a, a variety of platforms. So you could make a piece of UEFI malware that would work on a variety of architectures. Um, but, you know, firmware is just software. It's just stored on flash instead of on the hard disk. And so um, all the kind of tricky exploits you can do at, with software malware, you can do with firmware malware. It's just harder to, harder to install it. Uh, soft, Software has been, um, firmware has been evolving uh, over the time, and now there's better, easier tools to use this. And so perhaps it's, you know, like in the past with, with security, once tools got good enough, script kiddies started doing things. And perhaps it's getting to the point where the firmware tools are getting good enough that 
script kitties can become evil maids now. Right. For some models of machines. So, so how would somebody introduce malware onto a, 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 a computer? Would it be a, a rogue thing like, you know, click here to download this payload and install it? Or are we talking like where you can plug a thumb drive or a, like a Thunderbolt port where you have direct memory access to be able to flash? I mean, what, what are we talking about? So there's multiple ways to, uh, to attack uh, firmware. Obviously, you could you can um, USB firmware. Uh, is an interesting way rebooting a system with with a USB device um, with UFI with a UFI shell on it, but it's actually actually gotten fairly easy now that now that um, Windows Update updates firmware update blobs oh. from vendors, not all vendors, but many vendors. Um, this means that there is a user mode application that updates the firmware, um, and so if you have root, if you've if you've uh, obtained root access on that operating system, you could use that mechanism to update the firmware if you want if you had a firmware blob that you wanted to put in malware or in firmware you could use the update tools possibly so um looks like paul's got something else to say yeah uh, earlier you asked about what the threat model was and I, I wanted to say a little bit more about that okay um so uh yeah i guess to date uh most of the exploits that are known uh are nation state level uh, one of them was Hacking Team, which uh, is is a group that is known to operate at the nation state level mostly, right. even though they're a private company. Okay. Um, but what I wanted to say is that the th I think a better way of thinking about the threat model is rather than the type of attacker, because we've seen historically that nation states, well, in recent history, nation states have been a, a little bit ahead of the curve. They're attacking different targets. They're able to spend a lot more on resources and so forth. Um, and and non-nation state actors are focused more on financial returns, um, and why not just go for the easiest thing, then you get more for your money if you spend less time focusing on the attack and more time mining Bitcoin or what have you. Um, but I'd like, I, I'd like to really highlight that a firmware-level attack in this case is more going to be about the goals of the attacker necessarily than the attacker themselves. So if, you're, if your goal is to be persistent uh, or to be invisible, um, and both of those things are things that are much harder to do with, with uh, sort of your standard virus um, or malware, uh, where the, the antivirus is constantly evolving and so forth. It's much easier to be persist both persistent and invisible at the firmware level. Um, even if what you're doing effectively is injecting a virus, you can just keep doing that um, and or um, iterate out of that pro problem there. Right, because so, this, this uh, bypasses AV, this would bypass any endpoint solution because it, it's below the OS. Currently. It's constantly running uh, per, in, a, in persistence. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, and uh, so obviously, as, as Lee mentioned, part of the threat model there is there's a, there is a focus on, on physical access. Um, and so I think if, you're, if your threat model includes... Um, uh, that you have mobile machines that are that you're losing contact with. Um, if you're an individual consumer and you're traveling and you hand your laptop over to the to the the uh, TSA, now maybe that TSA actor is technically a, a state actor, um, but maybe he's just some guy who who wants to who wants to ha you know who also is getting a little money on the side to uh, hack um, for some private company corporate espionage. That that would be a use case where you literally have to hand over your machine. Um, and now, now a firmware level attack is easier. But as Lee said, you know, you don't need physical access to do that anymore. You can attack with a normal malware and then inject something in the firmware level, and and yeah, that's that's the end of the that there. And you've got a persistent invisible um, threat there. Right on. Um, and uh, Lee's Lee's handing me a note here. He said to to emphasize that this, this these kinds of attacks nowadays can work even when machines are off. And then that gets back to your your thing with uh, Intel management technology. Uh, the management technologies um, are designed to uh, to handle uh, machines that are powered off, so that you can power it up remotely. For example, using um, Wake on LAN, um, and some of the some of these embedded uh, systems, uh, such as IPMI, are designed to just stay on even when the the rest of the machine is p physically powered off. Uh, so you've got a whole other network interface that's always live, um, doesn't even need to be woken on LAN. Um, so that's um, and of course you know. A lot of the portable machines have batteries, so they're able to be in a in a, a mode where they have some low power component that's actually on, usually running one of these low level firmwares that's um, that that is potential for compromise. Okay. 
Um, cool. All right. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to waste all. You know, get all the secrets out um, because I'd like to go and have a full show about this at some point in the near future. Because you guys are still developing this. this. Is in an alpha stage, whatever it is you're working on. You have a an application, right, or something? Yeah. So what we're working on is something very similar to antivirus, antivirus, but for the firmware level. Okay. Um, and uh, so we we expect to have a release fairly soon of an open source version um, that will be sort of our initial. Uh, version of the software available to anybody who wants to use it, um, and uh, and then over time we'll release a, a management console and and you'll be able to manage a fleet of machines that way, um, and or integration with your your uh, whatever your enterprise uh, single pane uh, system you're using. Okay. So um, we'll be able to feed our data uh, directly into that. And tell you a lot more than you ever knew <laughs> about your firmware on your machines. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So, but before we go, I want to ask Lee: uh, Did you see any interesting talks today that you thought were were good? I have to ask because you were an attendee, so I'm going to ask other attendees. But you know, I've got I've got a captive audience. Uh, yes, of course. The threat modeling talk was excellent. With I, Robert. I, yeah. That, yeah. That was a great time. I, I found it interesting because he's talking about threats are the goals of the attacker. And, you know, those are the those are the things that they're trying to accomplish for, you know, which which I found like a, a different point of view. I was like, oh, yeah, they're not threats. Those are attacker goals, you know, and they're, that's 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 a, almost a positive wave. They're goal oriented people. So now they're like, you know, the threats that are out there are actually the goals of, of, of what they're trying to accomplish. So um, I, I really I really would like to have Robert on. But his new job says he can't do that. So we're going to have to figure out something. If we have him on the show, we just don't name names or something. I don't know. But yeah. So um, are you guys looking forward to any talks other than yours tomorrow? <laughs> thanks. <laughs> You're for, looking at the, yeah. Thanks yeah. for putting me on the spot. Of That's course. That's OK. Um, yeah, I was looking forward to Rob's talk on the, the um, new, new technology and old vulnerabilities. Yeah. And um now, which and one? obviously Adam's Adam's keynote, right? Um, right. Adam Adam is a, Adam's a friend of ours. So, yeah. um, so uh, which workshop did you go? I went to the threat modeling workshop. Did you go to to Rob's uh, public speaking one? Uh, yeah, I was at the, I was at the threat sh- threat workshop with you. So, okay, as he says, waving me off. All right. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we definitely want to have Paul. <laughs> we definitely want to have Paul and Lee on uh, to to discuss this more in depth because. Uh, I would really be interested in this. Um, and I, you know, we also want to do one on supply chain security in the near future because there's so many instances of, you know, not knowing where your information is coming from. You know, people have WordPress plugins that they don't mod- you know, monitor and they just, oh, we'll just install this one. And it opens like cross-site scripting and all kinds of issues. So there are a bunch of things out there, like CC Cleaner is a, a prime example of supply chain security. You install it thinking it's all good and, and, and you know, you get owned from it. So, um, do we want to mention the ebook? Is it out yet? Uh, so the ebook isn't out. It'll be out probably uh, next week. I'll next say week. next week. Um, and uh, and at the moment, uh, you can you can get a free copy of the ebook if you go to our website and sign up for. Actually, you don't have to sign up for our newsletter. You can just say, "I want a free copy of the ebook." So okay. Um, but I would recommend you also sign up for our. We're going to do a quarterly newsletter with uh, firmware security updates. Um, it's sort of an obscure corner of the security world. Yeah. Um, these won't be CVEs, of course. You can, you should be on those as well. But, uh, um, but we'll have a little bit more of our own flavor and information that we will provide via our, our newsletter. Does so. Miter not supply CVEs to firmware yes. updates? Yeah, there there are CVEs that come out, um, but uh, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna boast for Lee that he's he's way more on top of this in general than than almost anybody else in the entire ecosystem. Um, and his personal blog um, it tends to have a lot more updates. We'll, we'll right. con- 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 condense those into a quarterly newsletter for, oh. for easier consumption. Very nice. So uh, this is Lee. Brief answer on the um, CVE question. SCAP really doesn't have an oval definition for firmware. Uh, SCAP is really only suited for op- um, operating system application level stuff. So generally, if you find CVEs with firmware, it's because you did a full text search and found the word UEFI in there, but it wasn't okay. added to any proper oval metadata. It would be really great if SCAP and MITRE did oval definitions for firmware. Maybe the UEFI forum could work with DMTF and get a working group to get all that metadata together, and then you could finally use your SIM to track uh, firmware data. It's kind of crazy. There's a disconnect in the, yeah. the, uh, the area. We have tools today that generate results, but there's no uh, oval definitions to get those results into your sim. 
Okay. Kind of crazy. All right. So yeah, by the time the by the time this goes to to print and you're hearing it in your earballs, that ebook will be available. Where do they get that at? Um, so uh, we'll actually mail it out. Just email it out to you. Um, okay. So it, you have you have to give us at least your email address. Okay. Um, Totes not <laughs> spam at yahoo.com. Correct. Com. Okay. Um, Preosec.com. Okay. And uh, we will be putting it up for sale on Amazon and Google Play and so forth, but. Uh, but primarily, we'd like to get the word out more so than anything else. So Sure. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Paul and Lee, for uh, for coming on. We'll definitely have you on in the near future to talk more about this in depth. But, yeah, I'm uh, yeah, really, really excited to understand this better. So Great. Thank you. Thank you. This is Brian back uh, at Source 2017. I'm here with Joe Basirico. Uh, he's one of the speakers who will be speaking later today. Uh, sadly, I won't be able to listen to the talk. I'll watch it online, though, because all of the talks from Source is going to be uh, loaded up to Source uh, Source's uh, YouTube channel. So, uh, Joe, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, thanks. Um, so your talk that you're giving today is Building a Collaborative and Social Application Security Program. The first time I read it, I was like, what's a social application security program? But it's like building a collaborative and social application security program so um maybe you could maybe talk a little bit about what that means yeah so first off i will totally admit the title is terrible it needs a comma yeah i think it needs a comma. and the first version was just a social security program and that definitely wasn't right right so right. um yeah i'll probably change it to be something about bug bounties and how to get hackers and security researchers to talk with you and collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. So the idea is mm -hmm. that um, there are security researchers out there that are finding vulnerabilities in your software and everybody else's software. And it's worth your while to listen to them and receive their vulnerabilities and treat them with respect and have kind of a, a process by which you communicate with them and kind of move them through the process. So, um, you know, setting up things like a security at email address is a really important first step that a lot of companies don't have. Um, or uh, another way that a lot of companies kind of make a mistake is uh, the first contact with the security researcher is through their legal team. All right. And so you know, we want to make that easy. We want to uh, kind of make it easy for companies to roll out a program that allows them to collaborate with these security researchers. Um, and then also understand when's the right time to roll out a bug bounty program. Uh, rolling out a bug bounty program early can be super overwhelming. Um, you know, you can end up with hundreds of uh, uh, bug submissions in the first couple of weeks, and you have to have in place uh, a plan to triage those and, and uh, you know, move them through the process, decide if you're going to fix them, how you're going to do those things, and, um, and, and your whole plan. So um, without kind of getting your your ducks in a row before rolling out a bug bounty program, um, uh, you want to you want to make sure everything's kind of lined up. Right. So I mean, we we've, we've had other people on the show talking about bug bounties and how to implement them. Um, is there a checklist or something that you guys follow, or when when people go, hey, we want to start a bug bounty program, why would why would they know to come to you? One and two, do you ever go, well, you're not ready yet because these reasons? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, largely the checklist is, um, just our experience. We've been, you know, doing this for 15 years or so, and we've worked with a lot of different companies and a lot of different maturities. Um, and so what we'll do is, is kind of look at what the organization looks like from a security maturity, um, viewpoint. So, um, and kind of anticipate what will happen if they do roll out a bug bounty program. So if you're really early, Maybe the first thing you want to do is just go buy a tool, right? Like a, a web scanner or a static analysis tool or something like that. Um, and we all know how those work, right? Mm -hmm. um, I chuckle and say they miss 80% of the vulnerabilities and 80% of the vulnerabilities they report are false positives. Right. But they're a good first step and they're going to find the low hanging fruit and they're going to find stuff that you definitely don't want to have to deal with in a bug bounty program. You know, after that, um, getting an external security assessment with a, a real security company can be really good because now you can start to get a little deeper, um, get some understanding of what your application looks like from a, 
a, a, a black hat sort of viewpoint. Um, and then maybe shore that up with some education. So get your developers, get your testers some training, whether that's um, YouTube training or buy them a, you know, the Writing Secure code book or whatever you're gonna do, you can start out really inexpensively. Um, or you can get really thorough instructor-led training and bring an expert in and have them tell, tell you what to do. But give your developers and testers actually the tools to remediate some of these things. Go on an internal bug bash, um, find some vulnerabilities, fix those vulnerabilities, and then start to think about um, maybe getting your messaging right and how you want to frame your bug bounty program. Uh, maybe roll out a private bug bounty program first, mm -hmm. and then and then kind of go go all in. Um, but again, going full public bug bounty program straight away that can be overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, so. Uh, I, I got an email from a guy because he listened to our bug bounty talk we had with uh, Mr. Monsieur, Um and he had said that they were looking at a bug bounty program, but they had to limit the testing, where the testing was coming from. So they reached out to a third party. Mm -hmm. Third party set them up with something, but didn't say, okay, only U.S. people only. Or they mm -hmm. were like, well, we can make it U.S. only, but our really talented people are in China and Russia. And they're like, yeah, we don't want people from China and Russia testing our stuff. We don't care if, if they work for the government or not or whatever. Mm -hmm. How do you – so there's scope involved. So it's like, okay, you do just this application. You do the whole network. What kind of scope can you set on the bug bounty company that you may be hiring? Yeah. So there's kind of two different ways to do a bug bounty program. So one is um, to roll it out yourself and just um, kind of do an uh, – private bug bounty program where you invite certain um, security researchers from all around the world or work with the bug bounty um, kind of liaison mm -hmm. where um, those security researchers essentially sign up with them and then they kind of point their team of security researchers at your application. Um, and scope is super important. Um, one of the things that I really think is a, is a great um, place to start is to look at um, uh, Google's uh, vulnerability um, uh, research program. I think mm -hmm. they, uh, they've got a nice uh, web page up there that describes their scope and describes how to communicate to them, describes kind of the terms of engagement. Um, and that's huge because one of the things, um, one of the things that I like about that is they, they say, this is in scope, totally send us vulnerabilities that you find on, over here. Um, and this is what you can expect when you engage with us. This is kind of how much we pay out for different types of vulnerabilities. And then these things aren't in scope. And so they make it very clear. If we are if we just acquired a company, there's a six-month blackout, right? We understand that there might be vulnerabilities in this other company, and we're going to try to fix those, but we need six months to do that. Right. And that's totally fair. I think that you know security researchers understand that, right? Like when you buy a company just like you buy a truck on the uh, on uh, craigslist or something like you need a little while to drive around and see what needs to be fixed yeah. and then you can go and fix it and then you know you can do that so defining scope and that terms of engagement is hugely important yeah so you want it you want a fairly clear-cut scope you don't want something that's kind of ambiguous um I, I seem to remember like united airlines or one of the airlines had a bug bounty program where somebody had found something and it wasn't exactly in scope or, um, you know, maybe it was a language barrier with the guy, but they, they had a problem with the way he reported it. Mm -hmm. And um, they ended up paying up at the end. But um, so you were talking about an ombudsman. Is the ombudsman also going to be or a liaison? You're going to be would they also be involved with helping to make sure um, a, a proper uh, transmit of the, the bug involved? Or, um, you know, does the company work directly with the researcher? Yeah, it, it just depends on how those organizations work. Um, uh, certain certain companies, um, like you know the hacker ones and bug crowds of, of the world, um, they pretty much just manage your program. So they help you um, define those things, and then they give you a platform to um, for the researchers to send you in, and you can triage them. Mm -hmm. um, so you work directly with the security researchers in those scenarios. Right. Um, other ones, um, they're kind of the, the liaison. So, so they're kind of trying to do that first pass of filtering. Um, uh, one of the reasons why scope is so important 
is it can be really time consuming for um, both sides, right? It can be sure. really frustrating for the security researcher to say, oh, you know, every, every vulnerability we, um, we send you, you just say, oh, that was out of scope or um, no, we're not, we're not paying out for that or whatever. Yeah. That's really frustrating for their side. And it's really overwhelming for your side to get a bunch of vulnerabilities that you don't care about. Um, so again, scope is huge. Um, we've, um, you know, at, at my company, we um, I have a bunch of security engineers, and and they're free to go and and do these security, um, you know, bug bounty programs as they see fit, and they get to keep the money. And I remember helping one of my engineers do the submission, and he submitted, I want to say, 15 vulnerabilities to this company, uh, and only two of them he actually got paid on. The mm-hmm. other 13 were out of scope or already discovered or for any number of reasons kind of uh, rejected. Right. And it kind of took the, the wind out of his sails. Like he was like all really excited, all gung ho about reporting these vulnerabilities and making a difference. And then, um, you know, getting that email back from their security team going, oh, we're not doing it. Here's, you know, here's 50 bucks for those two that, that we didn't find. Could it, could it be more like he was expecting a lot more money than what he got and he was a little disappointed? Because, you know, they, they all pay out various mm-hmm. various amounts. So um, was it the fact that the company didn't have like a scoreboard or something or saying, hey, we've already found the, you know, these vulnerabilities have already been reported. You know, anything that you find in those areas is off the table now. I mean, how, how, how would a company report that to, say, the, you know, the company that's doing the bug testing? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, every security researcher is going to have their own reasons for um, for doing these things and and certainly there are um, some real uh, you know no I'm not going to tell any no disclosure at all until I get paid out and, and things like that there's certainly researchers like that um, but in my experience a lot of security researchers you know as as naive as it sounds they want to make the world a better place they want to make software more secure and mm. when they see security vulnerabilities especially some of them, that in their mind are really easy to find and really easy to fix, uh, remain unfixed or rejected because of scope, and they're not even um, kind of acknowledged for the effort that they put in. Yeah, you know, that can be that can be disappointing. Um, and so again, that kind of gets back to what I was talking about earlier. With um, it's important to respect the security researcher's time and say like, hey, you know, I appreciate sending all these over um you know bugs uh one through five we already knew about we have a fix in we're gonna you know we're gonna do this this is what we're gonna do um bugs six through ten um are out of scope for this bug bounty program but we'll get you in contact with that right team they don't have a bug bounty program but at least we're gonna work to fix them yeah and then the other two yeah they're they're totally bugs we're gonna pay you and we're gonna get them fixed that's a much nicer response then uh you know we're just throwing away these 10 and we're going to go with these two communication is really the key yeah 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 so do 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 the hacker companies like you know Synac and, and all those do they um so let's say your guy found those 15 bugs 10 of them are bad but two of them were good does he still get any kind of reputational credit for finding those 10 because if he didn't find those 10 maybe he's not as good a, a bug hunter Mm -hmm. as they thought does he get any kind of reputational credit or like you know not to my knowledge um yeah i think that that with most of these bug uh um, bug bounty programs and platforms um your reputation is based on the vulnerabilities that you find and and that are um kind of positively acknowledged through the other organization so Mm -hmm. if you find vulnerabilities that they already know about or that are out of scope uh, you get no rewards um, now, that organization could otherwise recognize you on their own um, organizational leaderboard yeah, or yeah. Um, thank you page or whatever. That's totally fair. Yeah. Um, but I think that most of the time with those, those normal platforms, they don't, um, they don't get any um, n- no recognition. Yeah, I've never actually done the, the, the bug, you know, bounty kind of thing. You know, I was always wondering how they, you know, how they measured those because there's all kinds of metrics. So, you know, mm-hmm. if you, you know, Hey, Bob found a hundred bugs, but only two of them were good. Or you know, Jim found fifty and forty-eight of them are good. Which one is a better bug hunter? In which case? Yeah, in the I mean, in 
it's interesting because if if the vulnerability hasn't been fixed, right? You you definitely want to tease away all of the false positives, right? right. Like if if you right. have a bug hunter that's that's just kind of carpet bombing with bad results, right? Like oh, there's cross-site scripting over there, there's SQL injection over here, and that's yeah. not. Then you know clearly that guy's reputation shouldn't be as good. Uh -huh. But um, but if the vulnerability is legit and you just haven't fixed it, then that seems like you should get rewarded for it. Yeah. Um, and you know it can get expensive, of course. That's the other side sure. of it. Is is you know a lot of organizations um, don't have the budget to to pay out huge amounts of money for for vulnerabilities, and a lot of them it's still a little immature where a lot of organizations. Um, are rolling this out as a trial or kind of seeing how it goes. Yeah. So what happens if you're like a really important company? You're like, yeah, we have a bug bounty program. Our max bonus, our max payout is going to be 250 bucks. <laughs> company like yours would be like, maybe it needs to be a little bit more. I mean, what, what yeah. kind of budget are we looking? Should we think of? And how do you, it would almost be like a, I don't know, you'd have to do some kind of, you know, threat modeling to go, okay, how bad can we get it? And, you mm -hmm. know, where we should go. I mean, yeah, it's it's tough. So, um, yeah, finding the right rewards and kind of balancing that is really important. I mean, this is where we get into like really detailed decisions around incentives, right? So, um, if you um, if you have no bug bounty program, but you're super thankful and super helpful when security researchers um, uh, send you vulnerabilities, that might be a great uh, social program, right? Like that might be a good program that gets people interested in working with you because, um, you know, they want to be on your leaderboard. Um, Donald Knuth, uh, one of the great computer scientists, you know, write books. And um, if you find a bug in one of his books, he'll write you a check. Um, and he writes you a check for one hexadecimal dollar. <laughs> Um, so two dollars and fifty six cents, <laughs> and you know, so obviously it's not a lot of money, but you have a, a real check from Donald Knuth for two, for one hexadecimal dollar that right. he writes out one zero zero and then hexadecimal dollars nice. underneath, and it's awesome, and it's a huge bragging rights, and it's um, it's you know one of the coolest things you can get as a computer scientist. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a ton of money, but it also has to be not insulting. Right, so if you say, if I find amazing remote code execution in your prod server and I can take over everything, uh, and you're like, cool, here's a t-shirt and $250, yeah, it's, people aren't gonna be looking anymore. Right. Um, so. Or the um, wrong kind of people are gonna be looking. Yeah, and they're gonna be selling it for yeah, more than $250. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's some, uh, there's some calculus to be done where it's like, well, how much is this vulnerability worth in the wild? Um, what's an insulting value, right. um, how can we reward this person properly? Um, and then you can get kind of cool with the results or the rewards, right? So um, Google pays out, um, their top reward is $31,337, so elite, elite dollars, nice, right? Nice. And that's that's pretty cool, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so you could pay out, oh, instead of paying out, Two hundred, two hundred dollars. Do two hundred fifty-six dollars, or right. you know, ten twenty-four dollars, or whatever. Um, and then uh, issue. You could do things like issuing custom T-shirts. So not just like don't send them the you know my company T-shirt. Send them uh, super elite uh, black hat, white hat hacker sort of T-shirts that nice. you yep. can only get if you submit through the bug bounty program. Yeah. Um, Facebook does a thing where. Um, they pay out their bug bounty rewards in white hat hacker debit cards. So you get a debit card that's totally black and it just says white hat across the top. Um, and, you know, it's got it's loaded up with that amount of money. Right. That's pretty cool, you know. And um, so people talk about it and and stuff like that. Um, you could issue challenge coins, all kinds of kind of cool stuff that, yeah. that you could do. OK, excellent. Um, so have you been to source before? No, this is my first time. Okay. So what, all right, so you work for a company, and what made you guys want to sponsor Source this year? Yeah, so um, it's a local uh, a local conference. I, you know, I always like to support local conferences. 
I think this one started in Boston, mm -hmm. um, but our main engineering uh, team is here in Seattle. Right. Uh, we actually have a, our headquarters is in Wilmington, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston. And so we actually knew Rob, the organiza organizer of Source. Um, okay. And so when he came over, you know, we started a talk. And um, mostly I submitted my talk. And um, when I heard about it, and then we started to talk some more. And he was like, you want to sponsor? And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, so it wasn't a pay to play thing. You actually like uh, so no. responded to the CFP and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I submitted my talk, got accepted. And then we started to talk about sponsoring. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so are you uh, looking forward to any of the other talks? I know other than yours, there's uh, lightning talks coming up, which I've been asked to speak at. I don't know if that's going to be a thing or not, but uh, is there anything else you're looking forward to the rest of the day? Yeah, I, I looked over um, the list. Um, they all seem pretty, pretty good. I saw one this morning um, on UEFI stuff and one on um, some risk ranking. Uh, overall, it's been a really good conference and um, I've been uh, happy to kind of sit in on some of the talks and, and hear about stuff. It seemed like a, a wide range of talks from yeah. really technical talks to some pretty high level businessy type talks. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty interesting. Yeah, I found it. Um, uh, it's definitely not a typical uh, security conference. The food spreads way better than most cons uh, <laughs> that I've been to. But um, you know, there's workshops on public speaking and how to you know be a better speaker. You know, there was a threat modeling one with Robert Hurlbut. Um, yeah, I just find it uh, uh, a different vibe at this conference, and so yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, if you've been to to HushCon or Recon or you know something like that, like you know, it's very focused on a specific topic of highly technical, challenging topics, and those yeah. are great. Um, you know, for security engineers and and folks in the industry, that's where we get our um, you know our knowledge and, and kind of share and work with each other, but. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that it's really important that other types of conferences exist where it's like, I work for an organization that doesn't focus on security all the time and I want to learn more about security. Right. So, um, yeah, we've we've joked about even uh, rolling out like a, a noob con, right? So just, uh, hey, if you're new to the security industry, this is some things you need to know. Um, yeah. I think it would be really useful. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we had the hardcore firmware stuff. Uh, I didn't get to see the Twitter intelligence ones. All these videos are going to be on, on their YouTube channel. But, yeah, um, it just ran the whole gamut, which I was I was really nice. It was really nice to see. There wasn't a blue team or red team talk. There were some, like, anybody talks that you could just show up and, and do. So it was yeah, very nice. Sure. So. Uh, Joe, if people wanted to discuss bug bounty items or you know your talk with you if there's is there a way they can get a hold of you online you're on the twitters i'm not on the twitters um i have long dismissed all of my social media stuff but um, i'm always happy for email so joe at securityinnovation.com security okay right on well thank you joe for coming on thanks a lot